working on victory over shame and guilt. And I know that's like a heavy one because I'm like, oh, shame. How are you talking about shame? Uh, But I trust that God is going to speak to us this morning as we listen to his word. Let us pray. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for this amazing privilege we have to be in your sanctuary. Thank you for the privilege we have to sing songs of praise to you, God, to speak liturgy to you, to pray. And now, God, we are here wanting to hear your word. Speak to us, Father. Your sons and daughters are listening. Anoint this lips of clay, God, that the words I speak will not be my words. It will be your words through my mouth, God. That it will bring hope, encouragement, freedom to everyone sitting in this space and those who are watching online. So, Spirit of the living God, have your way with us and have your way in us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Thanks, choir and all the music people. Uh, Thanks, Dana, for leading us this morning. And Bryson, for all the work you've done throughout the confirmation process. And thanks, Michelle, everyone who's helping with worship this morning. Kat, thank you for praying. Oh, my. I remember when I was in uh, Lacing, Kansas. It was a two-point church. Uh, The other church was uh, New Lancaster. It was a real smaller church. So I would leave the first church and then drive to the second church. And at times, some of the members were already there. And there was this little guy, Xander, was like three years old. And most often, Xander would do hide and seek. Initially, I didn't know that he was wanting to do hide and seek. So before I come, he's already hiding. The parents would be like, Xander is hiding. He wants you to search for him. So I have to go search for him all around the place and then find him. I'm like, yay! But you know how a three-year-old will really hide? Like, you can tell all their hiding spaces. They are hiding and still giggling. Uh, So you can tell the direction where the voice is coming from. But as he got older, by the time he was almost four, like Xander's hiding places were like becoming like really, really hard. And sometimes I'm up and down the church like, come on, Xander, where are you? Where are you? And he would just bust out into like one big laughter, like laughing, oh, Pastor Belma can't find me. And then finally, I'm going to find him. And uh, why do I share this story that uh, the Bible says uh, our God is a God who sees us. That even in our darkest darkness, even in the places where nobody else can see, God sees us. And one of the things about shame is that shame is the one thing that we want to cover, or guilt is the one thing that we want to cover that nobody else sees. But I like that God sees us even in that space, and when we allow the light of God to shine in the middle of our shame, he's able to bring freedom and relief. And the psalmist says, where can I go to escape from your presence? Even if I go to the deepest darkness, you are there with me. You see me. You can find me. So even when we try to do hide and seek and hide from God, he sees us where we are. And so there is no place we can run away from God. I wanted to be able to just uh, start by giving a few definitions of of, uh, guilt and shame. And I'm going to read some definitions that I got from some from counseling, some from the Bible dictionary and all of that. Uh, Guilt is an awareness of a failure against a standard. So let's say um, the part of, maybe I'm using confirmation, part of being a a confirmant is that you have to do A, B, C, D. And then maybe I missed one or two and I'm like, oh, I start feeling guilty. Maybe I don't qualify. Uh, So you miss a certain standard. While shame is a sense of failure before the eyes of someone else. So guilt is I failed in A, B, C, D. But shame is I am a failure. Shame speaks to identity. Guilt speaks to an act. And that's, what it's, that's why it's so important, because if we are not able to differentiate that. And, and most often when something happens, guilt says that I did something bad, and shame says that I am bad. Do we see the difference? I did something bad, and I am bad. Those are two distinct things. And, and, and what I wanted us to look at is the lies that shame tells us, and that most often we believe it says I'm a bad person. Anybody ever said that to you? Oh, I feel like I'm just a bad person. That is shame, like coming out like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, I'm not a good enough person. I am not a worthy person. I actually deserve this shame. I actually deserve what I'm going through. I actually deserve this suffering because of how bad I am. And, and uh, I like Brene Brown. Uh, she's, she studies uh, shame and vulnerability and all of that. I just I love listening to her, her podcast and reading her books because of just how incredible she is. Uh, uh, but she talks about shame. Most people that you find in jails has, have something to do with shame because it's something that, has, that is tied to your identity. 
most people that are struggling with addiction is because of an identity issue. It's a shame issue. It's not just about what they did. It's about how they perceive themselves for what they did. It's about how they think other people see them. It's like how they see themselves through the eyes of others. So, oh, I think this is how everybody sees me. Everybody thinks I'm bad. Everybody thinks I'm not good enough. Everybody thinks I'm not qualified because I think I'm not qualified, because I think I'm not good enough, because I think I'm bad. Now I assume everybody else thinks I'm bad. And it's really difficult to, to shift things like that in the heart of somebody who thinks like that. Because when you think that I'm bad, it doesn't matter how much good you do. It's like the one error always discounts all the other good. And it becomes really hard to walk in freedom. But it's funny that at times, even in the church, we feel like that. There are times we have a relationship with Jesus. We are born again. We are set free. We know Jesus. But we still walk with this sense of shame. Maybe because of something that we did in the past. And we keep attaching who we are to the events that happened in the past. But our identity is completely different from what we did. What we did is not who we are. Who we are is different from what we did. Because if we don't separate what we did from who we are, then it's going to easily lead down to a train that is destructive and uh, not helpful. I, I'm, I, when I was thinking of, of, this, of this topic, there were two people that came to me in scripture, Peter and Judas. Those two are disciples of Jesus. Both of them walked with Jesus. Both of them probably loved Jesus. They received the teachings of Jesus. They saw the miracles of Jesus. And both of them messed up. Both of them messed up. Someone would be like, oh, the degree of sin is different. It doesn't really matter. Both of them sinned. One of them who was like the closest to Jesus, like Jesus was like, this is my inner circle, denied Jesus on the cross. When he was going to the cross, three times he denied Jesus. He did like, I don't even know him, please. For, for, just forget about it. And not only did he deny Jesus, when Jesus died and Jesus is taken away, he's buried, he goes and tells the other disciples, men, I messed up. Come on, let's go fishing. Let's forget about this thing that Jesus taught us. So he doesn't only deny Jesus, he doesn't only sin, he influences all the others to turn away from Jesus and go back to the life they had left. So Peter is really not better than Jesus, than Judas. Judas sells Jesus off for him to be killed, betrays Jesus for a few pieces of silver and realizes that, oh man, what I did is so bad. So we realize all of them sinned against Jesus. None of them, none of their sin is better. Sin is sin. All of them sinned against Jesus. But their responses is what is significant. Judas realizes that what he's done is wrong. He goes to the people to give back their money, like, hey, take back your money. What I did was wrong, thinking that they will release Jesus, and they don't release Jesus. Instead of him like, hey, I'm going to go talk to my brothers. I messed up people. Can you pray for me? I'm, look at Jesus. is dying. It's my fault. It's my responsibility. Judas runs and hides alone. And when in the midst of failure, when we stumble, when we do something wrong, when we hide in shame, what the enemy does is he brings condemnation. He starts making us feel like we are bad, we are not good enough, we are not qualified. And the next thing, what happens to Judas? Suicide. Because he's thinking that all the other disciples are seeing him like he sees himself. He's not, he doesn't know that Peter himself has denied Jesus. He doesn't know that all the other disciples escaped except for John. Like, that would have been a crowd that would have been like, come on, welcome. Yeah, Peter, we all messed up. Oh. This, we don't even know why we did this to Jesus. Uh, Judas, please come. We all messed up. But Judas runs away and hides and covers the thing he's ashamed of. And when that happens, the voices that start speaking to him lead him to suicide and he kills himself. But on the other hand, we have Peter. Peter goes to the disciples, and it's like, I messed up. And I don't know if I can even follow this Jesus again, but let's, let's go, let's go, guys, let's go. Yes, he takes all the disciples away, and they go to something completely different. But what is amazing is that Peter recognizes his sin. He is vulnerable to talk to someone about what he's done. He's vulnerable to expose himself. He doesn't hide from community. He runs to community. He runs to a space where he can find help and find hope and find someone speak to him and speak life to him. And when Jesus finally resurrects, we are going to look at that. Brene Brown talks in her book, in, 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 in her book on vulnerability, and she says, uh, the sense of belonging and love are key, are key things that are important for human beings to live lives of wholeness. 
to live lives of, sen- of sensing that I, I belong. I, 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 I don't have to do A, B, C, D or have A, B, C, D to belong. I belong. I am a child of God. And when Jesus went to the cross and died that dead on the cross and resurrected and we believed him, we belong. We are sons and daughters of God. He's saying you are a child of God and you belong. None of you tells your children that if you don't clean the house five times, you're no longer my child. They don't have to do anything. You brought them to the world. They are your child. You like it or you don't like it, they are your child. If you say, I don't like you again, they are still your child. So they belong to your family. They are your children. And it's so important. It's the same thing for us. When Jesus went to that cross and died on the cross for us, Jesus is saying that you belong You are my child. I love you. And I don't love you based on what you do or based on what you have done. I love you because I love you. You belong because I choose to bring you in and make you belong. Your belonging has nothing to do with what your life circumstances are. The storms of life might hit you and crush you down and bring you to zero. But you are still my child. There is never a day God thinks less of us than the day when we first met him. It doesn't matter what we do. Am I saying that we should go along and just keep sinning? No. But even when we mess up and we go to the lowest part, God's mind towards us doesn't change. We are still children of God. And it's so important that we believe that. Because in the book of Galatians, God, Paul is writing to the Galatians because they had come to this place uh, in, in their lives where people had come to them. And they were telling them all of these lies about their faith. You have to do A, B, C, D. You have to do A, B, C, D. And Paul is like, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What happened to you? Didn't you know this gospel is free, that Jesus died and all you have to do is to believe and you are saved? So we be, bewitch you to start thinking you have to do A, B, C, D to qualify. Why do you have to start living in guilt and condemnation and start feeling like you are not enough? And Paul is rebuking them. And Paul, in the same when he's writing to the Romans, he said, there's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. So when we give our lives to Jesus, it's like there is no condemnation. We belong to this kingdom. We are sons and daughters of God. We have been redeemed. We have been set free. We belong. We are loved. When I look at this, there are a few things I'm thinking about. I'm thinking, even though Judas was part of the crew of Jesus, Judas never really felt like Jesus loved him. No matter how much love Jesus showed, Judas didn't really receive that like love. And that's why when whatever happened, happened. Number one, that's even why he could betray him. And number two, that's why when he sinned against Jesus, the next thing was to do what he did. If Judas really knew that he was loved and really valued and precious and that he deserved to be loved, that this love that Jesus is giving him, that he deserves it, he would have been like, yeah, man, Jesus loves me so much. So even though I've messed up, I'm going to go back to him. I know how much he loves me. He would not. Remember when Jesus resurrects and comes to Peter? He comes looking for Peter. And when Peter hears that, the Bible says Peter tore his garment and jumped into the water almost half naked to swim out to go meet Jesus. It's almost like, yes, I knew he loved me so much. Yes, I knew he loved me. I knew that even though I messed up, he would not cast me away. I knew it. I knew that he loved me. I knew that I was special to him. I knew it. And he runs and swims back and meets Jesus. And Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me? He's like, now I know you know that I love you. So now do you love me? Do you love me? If we are going to walk in freedom over shame and guilt, we have to believe that God truly loves us and that we deserve to be loved by God and that we are worthy of God's love. We are worthy to walk in all that God has called us to walk in, that we are children of God and we are worthy to be children of God, that we don't have to be quali- do anything to qualify ourselves as children of God. That we are worthy. If we don't have that, then it's going to be easy for the enemy. Every time we make a mistake, to make us feel guilty, to make us feel ashamed, and to make us want to hide. And the Bible says there's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done. I know at times when I say this, people are like, what does it mean everybody? Yes, it doesn't matter what you've done. 
It doesn't matter what your past was like. You are a child of the Most High God. You are loved. You belong to this kingdom. So there's therefore no space for shame. There's no space for fear. There's no space for intimidation. When Jesus went on the cross, look, take note of what happened. All through his journey, he was beaten, mocked, shamed, and on the cross. You know, when we do all the Jesus movie, we have to make it look a little decent. He was stacked naked. The king of glory was stacked naked. There is no shame like that kind of shame. Stacked naked, beaten, powerless, helpless. The miracle worker. Just imagine yourself, your important personality that you are. Finding yourself in a place of such humiliation. The first thing is to want to hide. But you know why Jesus took the shame? It's so that we don't have to walk in shame. It's so that we can walk in freedom. We can walk in joy. We can walk in gladness. We can walk in a life that is whole. We can walk the way God has called us to walk and celebrate who God has called us to be. And so the same way Jesus comes searching and pursuing the disciples who had messed up, Peter and the others, is the same way he pursues us every time we stumble. He hasn't changed. And if we are going to walk in freedom again, we have to remember that we are loved and that we are worthy of love. We are worthy of all God says we are worthy of. And let me close with this. There are times when I'm a, you know, childhood trauma. There are times, even in our parenting, that we bring our childhood sense of shame onto our children. Let me just give an example. Uh, I'm really short. <laughs> and one of the reasons why I never wanted, when I was, when I was in, in middle school, like, I was so short, and I was so ashamed of being short, that... Um, uh, when my cl- well, my classmates, w- they would call you to, the teacher would call you to come and ride on the board, and the teachers were a lot taller. Can you imagine me in middle school? Now I'm short, so imagine in middle school I was like this. And you have to come and ride on the board, and the board was a little high. And here I come, and I'm trying to stretch, and I'm not reaching, and the whole class is like, yay! And, and there was this shame. And so one of the things I never wanted to do, number one, was to stand in front of people. Number two was what? Be a teacher. And those two things, like, I will not do anything that involves me standing in front of people. Number two, I will not do anything that involves me teaching. Because it was so shameful. I'm so short. Why would I stand in front of people? But you know, when I gave my life to Jesus, it's almost like there was a sense of, I knew that well, your identity is not tied to your height. And then I just realized I'm not really as short as I thought. Because people were shorter than me, so I'm like, oh, Jesus, thank you. But then I had to start looking about the positive things about shortness. You know, when I hang out with those teenagers, we are the same. Like, except you get close to look at the face, you're like, oh, yeah, oh, she looks a little older. You, you cannot tell the difference. I can crawl under any table. I'm always in front when you take pictures. <laughs> yes. So, like, don't let the enemy take the negative thing. You take that negative thing and turn it and let it become something that is useful in God's hands. But there are times, as I said, when, when, let me say, as, as, as growing up as a, as, a, as, a, as a short person, then maybe I come and I have a child who is short. And then the child goes to school and then they're like, oh man, you're so short. If I've not dealt with my own issues, how will I respond to my child? Oh, well, I told you to be wearing heels. If you were wearing heels, nobody's going to look at you as short. It's a proof that I haven't dealt with my own shame issue and I haven't received, I, haven't, I don't believe that I am enough as I am. But if, if, if I've dealt with my issue and my child comes out like, oh, they were cheering on me at school that I'm so short, I'll come on like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I know how that feels. That's, that's who I was in middle school. But I want you to know that your identity is not tied in your height. You are beautiful. You are who God says you are. You are important. That is somebody who has been, who's, who's overcome their sense of feeling less uh, that. Because... Most often, the things that we go through as, as parents in our childhood will bring it into our adulthood, and it influences, it seeps into how we parent our kids, into how we respond to their challenges, into how we respond to their crisis, instead with empathy and love and compassion. Because we haven't loved that part of us well, then it seeps in, and then we respond to them from our place of pain instead of from our place of wholeness. So my prayer is that we are going to truly walk in freedom, 
and just truly believe that we are children of God, that we are important, we are valuable. We don't need to do anything extra. We don't have to do anything extra. God loves us the way we are. And for confidence, as you grow, you're going to make some big mistakes, some small, some big. Some of them, you're going to be like, man, that was a dumb decision. But never allow the mistakes you make to define who you are. Because God loves you no matter what. When you make a mistake, yeah, oh, that was a dumb decision. Well, you can do better. You're going to change. You're going to do better next time. And shake it off and move on. Never allow your mistakes to influence who you become or who you are as a child of God. Amen. Father, thank you so much that you call us to freedom. Thank you, Jesus, that when you went to the cross and you endured shame, it was for our sake so that we can walk in a life without shame, without fear, without guilt, and just experience your love and your grace. So help us to be like the Peters, that even when we mess up, we can still run to you and be vulnerable and be open to embrace your mercy. May we never forget that who we are has nothing to do with what we have, what we have done, but it has to do all with what you say, who you say we are. And we are thankful in Jesus' name. Amen.